sudden movements or otherwise the presentation might go off. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Julia. I'm the newly elected pirate in the European Parliament. Uh, I was elected in Germany, but uh, really, since we're a global movement, I'm, I try to spend a lot of my time traveling around to different countries and getting input from the different pirate parties so uh, that we can foreign policies that are really in the interest of the European people and stop trying to uh, represent national interests in this uh, parliament that is supposed to be European. Now, I hope uh, this technical problem is going to fix itself. Okay. Um, so, uh, my main topic that I plan on working on in the European parliament in the next five years uh, is really the founding topic of the Pirate Party when it first started, and that is uh, the issue of copyright reform. Um, I really appreciate uh, the invitation that I get to talk about this issue here. Um, I've, if I understand correctly, some of you are uh, pirates, some of you are academics, and uh, not everybody, of course, is from the European Union. So uh, what I'm trying to achieve with this presentation is give you an overview of the state of play of uh, copyright within the European Union and what we can realistically achieve in these five years. But uh, in the following discussions, I would really like to also get some input from the countries outside of the European Union on perhaps uh, um, good developments in their countries or also problematic ones that we could learn from or that I could introduce into the European uh, discussion. So uh, I really hope uh, for a lively discussion following the presentation. So um, what I really like about this issue of copyright reform is that uh, in contrast to a lot of other pirate topics uh, like for example censorship or surveillance, uh, it's not a negative topic. It's not that we're trying to fight this encroaching uh, crisis or problem, but really the issue or the idea behind copyright reform is a really positive one, is that we can uh, imagine a world in which uh, every person that has a connection to the internet basically has access to the, uh, the sum of knowledge and cultural achievement of uh, the human race. And um, I really like this opportunity of being able to uh, not just uh, fight uh, encroachments of, of civil liberties and so on, but really trying uh, to improve society in a way that could benefit everybody. So um, I've chosen this picture to start. Um, and uh, like all the other pictures in, in this presentation, <coughs> it's a, a free to use picture that was taken by the NASA astronauts when they were uh, first uh, going to space and uh, it's called Earthrise and was uh, taken by a NASA employee and hence is in the public domain so people are able to freely use this picture but of course this is not the case for uh, a lot of other uh, cultural works that have been accumulated in the past and um, reality is really uh, quite different today from uh, this vision of a world where we can freely exchange culture um, Okay, it's always going back really quickly, so yeah. I think uh, it works. Uh, reality is, is quite a lot different. I spent uh, part of this summer going to Sweden and uh, visiting uh, this guy in prison. And th that is Peter Sunde, one of the founders of uh, the Pirate Bay, the uh, file sharing platform, but also an internet entrepreneur who has started some other projects, like for example, uh, Flatter, a micropayment service, that is actually trying to um, integrate uh, the, well, making money of cultural works into this new digital society. And um, what is interesting about his case is that um, even though he is uh, clearly not a person who is trying to uh, rob artists of their livelihoods, I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be doing projects like Flatter where, uh, that are really trying to, to uh, give artists uh, a new way of making money, but he is rather just somebody who is uh, experimenting with the internet and trying to develop new technologies for making people, uh, giving people the ability to uh, exchange culture. And nevertheless, uh, the legal system and the political system at the moment in the European Union has uh, not led to a reform of copyright, but rather to strengthening enforcement. So 
um, Peter Sunde was sentenced uh, for the crime of uh, aiding and copyright infringement and is now serving a prison sentence uh, in a medium security prison with uh, where most of the other inmates are actually people who have been convicted of violent crimes. So uh, what we're seeing at the moment is that the political uh, reaction to this uh, these new issues that have arisen with, with copyright and these new opportunities that the internet is bringing is actually trying to preserve the old system. And um, a very uh, integral part of this old system is the idea of uh, intellectual property, which is the idea that uh, cultural works are stars, that uh, they are something uh, that is a limited resource and we need some sort of uh, mechanism to be able to distribute this scarce resource. And uh, actually, with the advent of the internet, we have achieved a new technology where we can make unlimited copies of cultural works without actually losing any money. I mean, copy, making 10,000 copies of a song, for example, doesn't cost more money uh, than having one copy, aside from maybe a little bit of energy that is uh, used. But uh, so really this, this idea of intellectual property that was once used uh, in order to, uh, to solve the problem that every copy was costing money is now a solution in search of a problem. And instead of trying to, to change this copyright system so far, we are putting uh, people like Peter Sunde in jail. And uh, when I was talking to him, he was actually uh, making a, an interesting analogy, saying that uh, the prison system is actually a lot like copyright, uh, in the sense that um, uh, for, for a very long time, uh, it's, it's a part of the legal system that is quite far removed from ordinary people. Most ordinary people don't really, they have never visited a prison, they don't really know what's going on inside there. And um, so there isn't a lot of public scrutiny about uh, the way that prisons are being run and if laws are actually being broken in this uh, area or if there are laws that are fundamentally unjust and are not working, then it is very difficult to reform that uh, through um, the uh, regular political process. And, uh, but there is actually a chance uh, in this digital revolution in the sense that suddenly a lot of people are actually affected by copyright laws. Every, every person who is on Facebook and is uh, posting links and, and pictures there is uh, probably routinely breaking copyright laws in Europe. And so uh, we are at a point in time where it is possible to finally start a, a large societal um, discussion about the question how we want to share culture and how important it is uh, to um, make culture available freely to all people. Um, so I want to give you an overview of uh, the state of the discussion in the European Union, um, what the pro current problems are and how we could in the next five years uh, change those. So uh, in the last 13 years, there has been very, very little change uh, in the copyright laws that the European Union has. And there has been very little, uh, well, integration of, of the new challenges that the internet has brought. I mean, 13 years ago, uh, there was, I think, no Wikipedia, no Facebook. Uh, I don't know if there was Google 13 years ago, but uh, if it was, it was just starting out. Sorry about the connection. Um, this picture is actually uh, a picture that was uh, made by an artist who died in the 1920s and has hence uh, entered the public domain. So once again, the cultural work from a very, very long time ago that I am now able to freely use, but this is of course not the case for any new works that are being created, even though a lot of them are not being commercially exploited anymore. So. Um, yeah, this, uh, this picture is called the consultation and uh, well, what the European Union has been doing this year is actually to start a, a public conversation on the issue of copyright. So they have started a public consultation, which means that every person, every organization or company was able to give their opinions on a very large range of issues. Um, should we? Okay. Um, and uh, this is a tool that has in the past been used relatively little by ordinary people 
And uh, I think one way how we can see that copyright is really starting to affect a lot of people is that uh, this time it has been completely different, where usually only maybe 100 or 200 uh, people or organizations would reply to such a consultation. This time uh, there have been over 9,000 replies to this consultation on uh, copyright. And there are a few ones, a few consultations where there have been more responses, but they have all been uh, consultations where it was possible to just fill out uh, a form online. So uh, this copyright consultation is actually uh, the first one where such a large number of people has sent in a response where they had to actually write down answers to open questions and not just click uh, a couple of boxes. So the, having these uh, over 9,000 replies is actually a large achievement because this gives us for the first time an idea of what ordinary people in Europe actually want and what problems they actually see with the current copyright regime. And uh, one of the reasons why we actually got uh, so many replies is because internet activists, uh, many from uh, the area or from the pirate parties, especially of Austria and Iceland, have been collaborating uh, to make it easier to reply to this consultation. Because uh, when the European Commission asked for your opinion, they simply put a Word document somewhere on their website with 80 questions. And then you're supposed to edit this Word document and put in your answers and uh, then send it back to them. So it's a very difficult process. If you don't have Windows, you're kind of screwed. I mean, they did put up uh, an open document version, but that one didn't really work. And also, it was only available in English. So a lot of people living in the European Union were excluded from this process in the first place because they don't either don't understand the English language or because they don't understand uh, the very technical terms that the European Commission was using. So uh, a bunch of pirates and activists started this um, project called copywrongs.eu, which was uh, first of all translating the questions into a lot of uh, different European languages, but also uh, writing kind of easy to understand uh, summaries of some of the questions. Like, for example, if you uh, are annoyed by the fact that YouTube videos are being blocked in your country, go to question 20, where you can give a reply to this particular issue. Or simply like giving easy to understand uh, examples from daily life to make it easier for people to actually reply to this questionnaire. And a lot of people actually uh, took part in that and took the time to fill it out. So now we have this big database of replies from uh, not just ordinary people, but also from institutions like libraries, from um, uh, collecting societies, from artists, and also from a lot of startup companies that are working with uh, cultural works on the internet. And they all gave their opinions about what works with copyright and what doesn't. And this is kind of the basic basis for the reform that we can now do. Now I broke it. Here we go. Um, so uh, at my office we have been starting to look at these replies and try to, to visualize them and organize them and find out what the different positions of the people are. And uh, we found something very interesting in there. That is that actually almost all of the users and also almost all of the uh, research institutions like libraries and researchers at universities are saying that the current copyright system is not working, that it absolutely needs to change. And on the other hand, you have particularly uh, the publishers, the collecting societies, or generally the people holding the copyright that are saying everything is fine with the current system and nothing needs to change. So if you are thinking of copyright as a system that is supposed to bring the different interests in society into a balance, then clearly this balance is not there in the, uh, in, at the moment because part, well, one part of uh, the ecosystem of people dealing with copyright is completely happy with the way things are going and the other part is completely unhappy. And also if you look at the, the number of replies that were sent in is that the vast majority of uh, replies actually came from individual, individual users that are asking the European Union for reform. And uh, I'm now going to present uh, the main issues where 
the uh, users and also the libraries and researchers and so on are saying these are things that really need to change and that uh, could be changed on a European level. Um, first of all, one of the perhaps most important issues, I was showing you these, uh, this um, work of art from, from the 1920s that is now in the public domain. Uh, at this point, old works are very, very rarely actually entering in the public domain because um, the copyright terms are at a regular basis being uh, lengthened in the European Union. This has uh, happened last in uh, uh, in 1993, when the European Union lengthened the copyright terms by 20 years. That means at this point, um, things only enter the, in the public domain 70 years after the artist said, has died. And uh, if you think about how long people actually make money of their works, this is quite weird because um, the way that copyright is usually justified is that uh, people say, well, if we don't have copyright, then people are not going to produce new creative works anymore. So copyright is supposed to be an incentive. But of course, if you have uh, a copyright that was uh, life plus 50 years, and then you lengthen it to life plus 70 years, it's very hard to imagine that any of the people who are already dead are going to suddenly stand up from their graves and decide, okay, well, uh, I feel incentivized now to make more cultural works. And uh, actually, the vast majority, for example, of musicians, if they make money off their works at all, they do that in the maybe five to 10 years after they have actually released their works. And it is very, very few, like uh, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, where their ancestors are going to make money of their works for a very long time because they are like world-renowned artists that are extremely successful. But of course, nobody, uh, well, expects that they're going to become a world-renowned artist that is going to make money of their works for uh, decades. Most uh, artists, uh, if copyright works as an incentive at all, it's going to work as an incentive in the way, okay, I'm going to make enough money to support myself, and uh, perhaps I might even, you know, become famous, and of course that is an incentive to some people, but they are not going to think, well, if I don't make money for 70 years after my death, then it's not worth becoming famous. That's the, it's just not realistic that copyright is actually going to work that way. So we are now in a situation where a lot of works are out of the public domain and um, people are not able to use really the vast majority of works that, are, that have been produced by humans in the, uh, in the last uh, 70, 80 years, even though most of these works are not being commercially exploited in any way. So these works are locked down and nobody actually profits from that. So this is uh, one of the main complaints that uh, users have been making to the European Commission that this extension of copyright terms has to stop. Um, another problem is that uh, the way that, that European laws work is that, well, usually laws are made on a national level, and then uh, the European Union passes directives that uh, tell the member states within the European Union that they have to fulfill certain minimum criteria. And uh, the way that uh, copyright in the European Union is set up right now is that it doesn't say, tell the member states uh, the minimum users' rights or the minimum rights of uh, universities and so on that they have to fulfill, but rather it gives them a closed list of exceptions from copyright that they may fulfill. So uh, instead of telling the member states, well, if, if there is a building that is standing somewhere outside, you have to give people permission to make a picture of that and put that on the internet. Rather, the European Union so far is only saying, well, you may pass a law that says that. And this leads to uh, an extremely paradox and weird situation right now. Uh, for example, if I go on holiday, or if I go to work, actually, at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, and I take a picture of the building of the European Parliament and put that on the internet, I commit a copyright infringement because um, within the European Union, only 13 out of the 28 member states have uh, what is called freedom of panorama. Freedom of panorama means 
that uh, if somebody, if a building or a work of art is visible on the street, you're allowed to take pictures of it and use them any way you see fit. Uh, well, France is not one of those 13 states, so in this case, if I take a picture, the architect actually has to give me permission to use that picture. And uh, this is uh, funny because even uh, the administration of the European Parliament wasn't fully aware of this fact. So um, the Wikipedia, which is only allowed to use works that are, uh, well, not copyright protected or works that are on a, under a Creative Commons license or something like that and can be used commercially, only those can be used in Wikipedia. So Wikipedia went to the administration of the European Parliament saying, well, we have this picture of the Parliament, can we put it in the article? And the administration said yes. And then it turned out later that uh, the administration didn't actually have the power to do that because the copyright lies with the architect that at some point built this building. And of course he doesn't actually enforce it because, uh, well, most copyright, uh, especially these weird laws, aren't actually enforced by anybody. So uh, we have this situation where a building that is actually the most public of all buildings, where parliament resides, can't actually be uh, put online as a picture to illustrate, look, this is where our public representatives are meeting. Um, and this is just one example of a very, uh, uh, well, it's very symptomatic of the way that copyright is being used in the European Union right now, which is that even governments, even companies, even public institutions break copyright all the time because the rules are so complicated that they don't even realize it. Or they use very weird legal loopholes to try to get around copyright. So rather than reforming copyright, we are trying uh, to rely on loopholes. So this is the picture that is actually in the article about the European Parliament uh, on Wikipedia. And uh, this is, of course, a picture of the European Parliament. So you may wonder, hey, why are they allowed to use this picture? And that is because uh, this freedom of panorama or lack thereof is actually interpreted by courts and it's interpreted in different ways. And um, one interpretation of the copyright law is that, well, if the focus of the picture is not actually the building but something else and the building just happens to be in the background, then you're allowed to use it. So in this case, uh, this is not a picture of the European Parliament. It's a picture of the flags in front of the European Parliament, and the Parliament just happens to stand behind it. So um, clearly, this way of enforcing copyright is not working. If even the, uh, the administration of the Parliament is relying on such weird exceptions, then something is not working. Another exception would be Strasbourg is quite close to the German border. If I happen to stand in Germany while I take the picture and have a really, really good camera that can take a picture over long distance, then I could legally take a picture of the European Parliament standing on German ground and then put it online because the freedom of panorama applies to the place where I take the picture and not to the place where the building is standing. So clearly this is a bit weird. Um, another case where the European Union does not force its member states to make an exception for copyright is official works that are made uh, by the government. It's another uh, example from Wikipedia because they are very efficient lobbyists in Brussels and bring a lot of good examples um, of official works. This is the page of uh, Jacques Chirac, former French president. Uh, he, well, uh, you might wonder why they p it shows this sort of odd picture of him where he's kind of looking <coughs> off the screen. And this is the case because there does not exist a single picture of Jacques Chirac made by the French government that is actually under a free license. Everything that is made by French government employees is the copyright of the French government employees. And so Wikipedia can't use it. This picture, wh why is he looking to the side? It's because he's standing uh, next to Bill Clinton and this picture was made by American government employees. And uh, every employee of the American government 
when they take a picture, just like this picture, when NASA, of NASA, of the Earthrise, uh, is automatically public domain because, um, well, their reasoning, their reasoning is that these employees, these state employees, are not artists, but they are paid to perform certain function for uh, the government, and all the works that they make belong to the taxpayer, which makes sense. But uh, in the European Union, well. Member states are allowed to pass a law like that, but they are not uh, obliged to do it, and so most member states don't do it, uh, even though it doesn't really help them economically. I mean, uh, most of, like for example, in Germany, um, the the German government uh, makes less money out of enforcing the copyright on the works that they uh, make themselves then they have to pay for the enforcement. So they are actually losing money and uh, they would have, they would end up with more money if they simply made all the works publicly available. So clearly uh, there is no monetary incentive for governments to not make these, uh, uh, to, to not free their works of copyright. So maybe there's another reason. And um, one reason there might be is actually that copyright can be used for censorship. Um, in Germany, we recently had a case uh, where, fortunately, the Constitutional Court in Germany rejected the 3% threshold uh, in the, uh, for the European elections, and that's actually the reason why I'm in Parliament now. Um, before that happened, uh, when the government introduced this 3% threshold, they, before that, asked their uh, lawyers within the Ministry of the Interior whether they thought that this law would be constitutional. And they said, well, no, this 3% threshold is going to be unconstitutional and it will probably be rejected by the Constitutional Court and we strongly advise against introducing this 3% threshold. So the German government introduced it anyway and of course the Constitutional Court rejected it. And um, well, the, the, an NGO um, used freedom of information laws to get these internal documents where the lawyers are arguing against it to show that uh, the government is deliberately passing unconstitutional laws. And uh, well, the Ministry of the Interior was forced to give out this document because of the freedom of information law, but they told the NGO, you are not allowed to publish it on the internet, you are only allowed to read it yourselves because the lawyers working for the Ministry of the Interior have copyright on this uh, text. So this is, well, they published it anyway, then they were sued by the Ministry of the Interior, then they used freedom of information laws to get uh, the decision to sue them, and so now there's a funny cat and mouse game there. But uh, my point is that uh, sometimes it is of course, absolutely clear that this is not uh, about defending the right of personality of the lawyers working for the Ministry of the Interior, and it's also not about incentivizing them to write reports in the future, because of course they're going to continue writing reports because they're being paid for it. And so in such cases, when governments are not making their own documents freely available and free of copyright, it might also be because they can use this to suppress information that uh, is not useful to them. Um, so, another thing that is uh, an issue with the current copyright regime is that it is in a lot of ways criminalizing pop culture. This is also something that a lot of users have mentioned uh, when they uh, have replied to the consultation uh, by, by the European Commission is that they said, well, things that we do every day on Facebook or on Tumblr, they are all copyright infringements. Uh, these are examples of reaction groups, like uh, somebody might post on Facebook, I don't know, uh, I uh, last day of work, and then post this uh, reaction gift from Forrest Gump with his guy running away. Uh, this is a copyright infringement, so this is the only uh, well, one of two sides with copyright infringements in this uh, presentation. I'm, uh, yeah, just gonna have to deal with that, I guess. But, um, of course, nobody is going to say, well, I'm not gonna watch Forrest Gump now, 
because I watched this reaction GIF, and I, now uh, the movie is worthless to me, it's actually much more likely to be the other way around, that people see this reaction GIF and see like, oh, this might be a funny movie and might try to find out something about it. So um, this is actually something where copyright is really counterproductive to anybody, except for an industry that, is develop that has developed that is actually making money off suing people. So uh, especially, I, I used this picture from uh, a football game. I think this is uh, Jürgen Klinsmann, the coach of the US team. Um, because in sports in particular, uh, the, the copyright holders of the football games are routinely suing people who use this reaction gifts on the internet. Uh, I don't know how many of you watch football from time to time. US football. No, but uh, any football or soccer, a few. Uh, who watches uh, recordings of football games that have run last year? Okay, <laughs> all right, but I mean, usually that's, I, I would assume, not the use case. Most people watch football when it is running, and the people who hold the copyright make money by selling the rights to show it, and then they get a lot of advertisement revenue. And uh, it's quite ridiculous to assume that uh, people using reaction GIFs from football games of you know funny scenes or somebody uh, jumping around like that are actually going to hurt the copyright holders. Um, so the current copyright regime is uh, criminalizing a lot of kind of normal youth culture of people using snippets from movies to show emotions of some sort. Uh, another issue. Uh, where you're probably breaking copyright all the time uh, is embedded linking. Um, when I link to something that is copyright protected, that's usually no problem. Uh, it's a fundamental building block of the internet. If I uh, post a link to, uh, I don't know, uh, a YouTube page with some copyrighted material, I'm not legally responsible if that is a copyright infringement. But uh, now, recently, more and more, especially social media sites, have started these embedded links. So if I post a link into my uh, uh, Facebook status box, it automatically shows uh, a picture from the page that I'm linking to. So if this picture is copyright protected, some courts are arguing I'm actually making this picture available to the public and I'm committing a copyright infringement. Of course, this is... Uh, in some countries uh, being used by the copyright holders to uh, introduce new laws that are supposed to make them more money. I mean, uh, most uh, of, the, of the websites that show copyrighted content also show advertisement. Like the classic example would be an online newspaper. They actually want people to come to their page and to uh, read the articles because they can make uh, money of the advertisement revenue. But uh, they want to charge the sites that are linking to them money for the links. And uh, even though they, are, they rely on that. So uh, we have laws like that in Germany or in Spain that are mostly aimed uh, at, uh, well, it's mostly um, newspapers and newspaper publishers trying to get money from Google for offering Google News because they have these little uh, pictures and snippets in there. And of course, usually what Google says is they say, well, okay, we're simply not going to link to you anymore. And then they get super nervous because they actually want the links, but they also want to be paid for it. So in Spain, they came up with something really ingenious. They passed a law that says, uh, not only do you have the right to get money from Google, you are not allowed to give away this right by contract. So. Um, in Spain right now, uh, it's an inalienable right to be paid for uh, people linking to your content, which means you can't even voluntarily say, hey, I want you to link to me. No, no, you have to uh, basically keep this right to be paid for it, which means that people just stop linking to each other, which is fundamentally breaking the internet. Uh, another legal uncertainty right now is peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing in the EU because um, usually it's perfectly allowed to uh, non-commercially, privately share content that you have bought with your friends. 
And if you burn it on a CD and simply hand it to somebody else, it's perfectly legal. But uh, it's not allowed to make things publicly available to, uh, to a large audience that is not limited to your friends, whatever that means. So uh, if you have something like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, where uh, a page like the Pirate Bay is only offering the, the torrent links and the connection where people are exchanging information is purely between individuals, uh, this creates a legal uncertainty and it's entirely dependent on the courts of how they interpret it. Is it a copyright infringement or not? Uh, that you find out whether you have actually broken a law or not. And uh, like in Germany, the situation is uh, you're allowed to leash, so you're allowed to download from others, but you're not allowed to see, uh, which is, uh, well, if you know, the way that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing works is extremely weird. Um, but uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it's not just the individual users that are complaining about this. Uh, it's also institutions like libraries, researchers, especially universities that are saying, hey, the system is completely crazy. Basically, universities are employing researchers that are paid for by taxpayer money to produce knowledge that is then published in private, uh, um, well, uh, academic uh, magazines like uh, Science or Nature or something. And then the libraries pay those magazines to be able to access that content that they have themselves produced. And at the same time, the state-employed uh, researchers are using their free time to peer review this uh, content. So it's really kind of an odd system. And um, another thing that especially libraries are having to deal with is that uh, when they want to, well, when they have old media like uh, CDs, for example, uh, after 10 years or so, they start breaking down. Uh, this doesn't happen that quickly with books. Most books, if they are stored properly, can easily last for a thousand years. But this is not the case with like cassette tapes and uh, CDs and other more modern media. So at some point, they have to start archiving them. But uh, a lot of these media are uh, made with copy protection, with uh, digital restrictions management that keeps them from freely making copies. And um, sometimes they're also legally not allowed to do that. But um, first of all, the libraries don't have the money to actually find out, uh, to, to actually pay everybody who holds the copyright to be able to archive that stuff. Uh, they also often don't even know who the copyright holder is in the first place because uh, libraries archive huge amounts of works that have at some point perhaps been donated to them and there is no central registry that tells them who they even have to ask for permission. So you have this large amount of orphan works that nobody is profiting off the copyright because you don't even know who the copyright holder is but you're not allowed to archive it anyway and you're not allowed to make it available to the public. So time uh, after a certain amount of time, this knowledge and this culture is simply lost to the world because we're not able to make it, uh, to store it in a permanent manner that doesn't simply uh, fall apart after a few years or decades. So th th these are the concerns, or the main concerns, that have been voiced by the users and by the institutions that have answered to this copyright consultation. <coughs> and what is really striking is that at the same time, the rights holders, or most of them anyway, are saying everything is perfectly fine, nothing needs to change. If anything, you know, like if you look at any suggestions they have for changes, they say, well, uh, maybe if you want to link to copyrighted content that should, uh, you should have to ask for permission or maybe just looking, uh, just browsing to a page and looking at a page like for example watching a streamed uh, video that is copyrighted should be illegal so that they could actually go to the end user and ask for money from them and some of them are also saying well perhaps there should be a right for artists to be paid uh, which is a concept that has never worked in the past because uh, if an artist has a right to be paid that basically means that even if their 
art is complete crap and nobody wants to see it, they would still have to be paid by somebody, which of course uh, has never been the case and uh, is likely never going to be the case. So, but other than that, the rights holders are really saying, well, everything is fine with the current system. And if you're looking at all the problems that I have mentioned before, there are actually a lot of uh, issues where the rights holders are not really profiting of the current system at all, but still there are clear problems and things that need to be changed. Um, now, the strategy of the European Union has for a long time been to simply uh, make small fixes to, to change a particular part, like, for example, change the laws for European collection societies to make it a little bit easier to uh, offer the same content across borders. Uh, because, like, uh, if I travel within the European Union, a very common thing is that uh, if I pay for certain content in one country and want to access it from another country, I can't because it's blocked on, a, on an IP address level. And uh, so sometimes they pick out one of these problems. There has also been some uh, work done on this issue of orphan works, but it's usually just patchwork, and they don't really ask themselves the fundamental question of how can we update copyright to the digital environment. Um, so now uh, that I am in Parliament at, uh, uh, for, for the European Pirates, I kind of have to ask myself, well, what needs to change on the European level? Um, and um, one idea that has uh, floated around quite a bit, uh, which is a very on the one hand, a, a very um, interesting idea and that has a lot of opportunity, but also a very risky idea, is that of making a completely new European copyright that is a directly applicable law in the individual countries. Um, the issue with, with European laws, or well, with European regulations, is um, that they can make a lot of things a lot easier. If you have a European-based uh, copyright, then you're not going to have uh, messages like this video is not available in your country because the, uh, if you had a European copyright, then the European Union would be treated as one country and uh, exchanging culture within the European Union would be a lot easier. But at the same time, it means that 28 countries would have to come together, not just in the European Parliament, but also in the Council and in the Commission, and actually come up with a compromise that is uh, so uh, advantageous also to the users that we would actually prefer this to, to the status quo. So uh, we really have to, like if we're going to do this, we really have to make sure that a certain minimum criteria uh, are fulfilled by such a European copyright to even make it a worthwhile idea. Um, and I just want to, to present a few things that I personally think would have to be included in such a thing and I would also like to use the discussion to, to think about like uh, is, this a, is this a worthwhile endeavor and what, what would a European copyright need to look like for the pirates to actually support it. Uh, I think one uh, of the fundamental things that has also come out of the consultation is that we need to stop this infinite copyright, uh, that uh, the copyright terms can no longer be retroactively lengthened. It's, it's very difficult to actually shorten copyright terms because the European Union has signed uh, a couple of international treaties that limit uh, the um, well, the, the wiggle room of how low they can go with copyright terms, but it has to be absolutely clear that they have to be as low as possible within the international obligations of the European Union. Uh, another thing is that uh, in order to not break the internet on a fundamental technical level, the uh, linking to content on the internet and also browsing to web pages uh, can never be a copyright infringement by an individual because copyright should be a commercial right and not something that restricts you in the fundamental use of the internet. Uh, another thing uh, that comes from uh, the American tradition of copyright and that I think is worth discussing is uh, introducing a fair use clause. 
Uh, fair use means that um, even if you are doing something that uh, is a copyright infringement, there can be justifications for that, and these justifications are defined by, by court rulings. So, uh, for example, in this uh, case of the reaction gifts, uh, any reasonable court that would get this, uh, you know, uh, people suing other people for using reaction gifts could say that, well, this is clearly a parody or a citation. This is a case where somebody is using just a tiny fraction of a film and is not actually causing uh, the owner of the film's copyright any damage. So clearly, in this case, the, the public interest in allowing this form of, of art is bigger than the interest of the copyright holder of protecting these three seconds of their copyrighted film. So this would be a possibility for courts to adapt the way that society evolves and that technology evolves to the copyright regime. And uh, I think on a more fundamental level, I think that uh, such a European copyright would have to uh, have a different perspective. Uh, rather than looking at copyright as a protection of artists purely, there would also have, it would have to be more a weighing of the interests of, uh, of artists on the one hand and uh, universal users' rights that would have to be uh, uh, well, these rights would have to be guaranteed in all of the member states, like, for example, uh, the right to education and the right to use uh, copyrighted works for your personal education without uh, having to uh, pay for accessing them. And so, on a, on a cultural level, this would also mean that we look at every person that participates in online culture as an artist, as somebody who is contributing to the sum of knowledge and culture that uh, uh, the world has achieved and that they are not purely consumers. So it, it would be a shift from a read-only culture where we have the audience on the one hand and the artists on the other hand. We would look as, at every person in society as creators and audience at the same time. So going from a read-only culture to a read-and-write culture. So. How realistic uh, is this change at the moment under the current uh, political landscape in the European Union? Um, we recently elected a new uh, Commission President, Jean-Claude Juncker, who is famous for some uh, surveillance scandals in Luxembourg, but has also said some quite interesting things in his campaign, which is that uh, of his five-year plan of what he wants to change within the European Union, uh, part of his top priority was actually the, what he calls the digital single market, which means uh, having common rules for uh, internet-related topics like copyright in all of Europe. So here we have uh, a commission president who apparently is actually interested in making such a European copyright. So that means uh, from a pirate perspective, this is probably the most interesting time to be in the European Parliament because uh, the European Parliament itself does actually not have a right of initiative. So uh, we uh, pass European laws, but we cannot uh, start them ourselves. So we are dependent on the European Commission to make a proposal. And so it's quite interesting to see that the current Commission President actually wants to make a proposal on copyright. And it's actually saying that uh, nothing has changed in 13 years and uh, the moment has come to seriously re-engage with the questions of copyright. And copyright may not impede the digital ambitions of Europe, but must be an instrument to mobilize the European digital potential. So this is quite an interesting quote. Uh, that he said uh, when he was uh, when I asked him about his uh, copyright plans, it's an interesting quote because it shows that at least he has understood that under certain circumstances, copyright might actually be harmful to uh, the digital ambitions of Europe, whatever that may be. So, for a conservative, I think that's at least a small sign that. Uh, well, that he acknowledges that in the, in the digital era there might be some problems with copyright. So now uh, it's really up to us to see 
what this proposal that the European Commission is going to come up with is going to be like. And then, uh, well, if it's terrible, then of course I'm going to be in fundamental opposition to it. But if it's actually going in the right direction, then the pirates might actually have the chance to form this European copyright in a way that is in our interest. And um, one, uh, perhaps one of the most important questions uh, on which direction this is going to go is uh, which part of the European Commission is actually going to be in charge. Because uh, the European Commission works a little bit like a national government. Uh, it doesn't have ministries for different areas, but it has uh, so-called uh, directorate generals. And you could kind of think of them as something like ministries. And uh, so there is one that is responsible for the internal market, so for economic matters and uh, the exchange of uh, goods within the European Union that is currently in charge of copyright. But uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has also said that he might want to um, switch copyright from this economic digital, uh, from this economic single market area to the Directorate General for Digital Affairs. And um, right now, uh, in the old commission, we have a commissioner for uh, the digital agenda, Nili Cruz, who is actually extremely critical of uh, the current copyright regime and is saying that uh, it, the current copyright is fragmented, inflexible, and often irrelevant. So she's even acknowledging this fact that even, you know, not only users, but also companies and uh, official institutions are simply ignoring the law because it is so out of touch with reality. So um, depending on who is going to end up in charge of this new European uh, copyright might really influence the content. So uh, this is an ongoing discussion within the European Commission at the moment. And uh, it's very interesting to kind of keep track of that and try to influence uh, to actually make European copyright uh, the issue of the digital uh, part of the Commission and not of the um, more market-oriented part, because this also means that uh, the changes in copyright that we need are about the digitalization of society and that copyright is no longer purely a market mechanism, because it affects all of us in our daily lives, even if we don't make money off of it. So uh, it's, I think, one of our um, uh, biggest tasks in the upcoming months is really to fight this battle with, with the Commission to try to get the right people in charge and to shift the focus of what copyright is supposed to be. Because uh, the people who are in charge of copyright in the European Commission at the moment, they really just look at it from a commercial perspective. And uh, I think uh, getting the, the digital agenda people in charge of copyright would really shift the focus in a way that we can think about users' rights and about uh, research and about the effects that copyright has on society at large. Uh, another thing that we need to increase doing is actually going to the European institutions in Brussels and uh, doing lobbying there. Uh, if you ever have the chance, and I invite all of you, uh, to actually come visit me in Brussels. I also have uh, some funding to, to pay for people's trips to go there. I simply spend time in the European Parliament, go to conferences and events around copyright issues and simply raise your concerns there because a lot of the European parliamentarians are not actually evil and they try to uh, work in the interest of the people. And if you tell them something like, did you know that I'm not allowed to post a picture of the European Parliament on Facebook? They would be completely astounded because they have never heard of these problems. So it's actually quite important for us to also look at ourselves as lobbyists and to engage with the people who are working on these issues in the European institutions. And of course, uh, quite a few of you might have been involved in the protests against ACTA a couple of years back. Uh, this was really a case where uh, a lot of quite horrible uh, new copyright enforcement uh, ideas were being put on the table and it, it was only possible to stop them because we had 
widespread protests all over Europe that really brought uh, tens of thousands of people to the streets. And it's extremely important to keep that up and to really reject bad proposals with uh, direct action on the streets because um, what the European Union is lacking quite a lot is the European public and uh, people in Brussels notice a lot when uh, the public in different European countries is protesting about the same thing like for example right now we might uh, get this kind of momentum with the transatlantic trade agreement between the EU and the United States uh, such ideas that I think are going to be quite harmful for the pirates are only going to be stopped if we have uh, protests on a European level and not just in individual countries. Um, these are just a few uh, ideas from my side on how we can shape this, uh, this debate and this campaign around copyright within the European Union. Um, but I would really like to also get your insight on uh, what you think, you know, what are, what should a European copyright look like, what, how radical should we be in, uh, in our uh, demands, like, I mean, I would assume that there are also some pirates who would say, let's get rid of copyright altogether, uh, but this might not be something that I can achieve from within the European Parliament, so I would really like uh, to also ask you to, to give me concrete ideas of uh, what we should be pushing for and what, from your perspective, are the biggest problems with the current copyright regime. And also, if, uh, especially from the countries outside of the European Union, uh, I'd really like to know like what the situation is like in your countries and whether there are laws that we could be learning from. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, here you have the sources of uh, all the pictures that are in public domain. Uh, Except, uh, well, for the animated GIFs, they are just blatant copyright infringements, but uh, I claim uh, fair use for those, and I thank you all for your attention. Excellent. Is there any question? Hey, thanks for that. Um, so, two, uh, so one question and one point. Uh, the point, um, so there are currently 20 exception, uh, or like optional exception clauses in the EU copyright directive. Uh, and along with recital 36 and all of that, um, basically it comes out to there being 9 to the 20th power uh, ways of implementing the copyright directive which basically comes out to about 30 million times more ways of implementing it than there are stars in our galaxy. Um, so, uh, would, would there be any sense in trying to uh, remove the optionality of those, uh, uh, yeah, um, so you'd say yes or what? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think um, th this was actually a big part of uh, the of the consultation that the commission was also asking people directly like uh, do you think that the current list of exceptions to copyright is appropriate and should some of them be made mandatory and so on and really the the copyright holders were the only ones arguing that they should not become mandatory but they didn't really offer any arguments for them except uh, cultural diversity but of course, uh, it's very easy to show that cultural diversity is not really uh, improved by uh, having different exceptions to copyright. Because, I mean, uh, yeah, in a very twisted way, you could say if I'm not allowed to use my uh, open education resources that are made in Germany in Austria, then that improves cultural diversity in the sense that uh, Austria is going to have different open education resources. But um, it, it's not the kind of cultural diversity that we want. So I think it's very uh, easy to make an argument to say that, well, if something is in the public good in country A, then it's probably going to be in the uh, public good of country B as well. And therefore, I think that um, making the exceptions mandatory would be one of the more easy to achieve, uh, but also one of the most uh, important and effective uh, changes that we could make.
So uh, the second question is, uh, so the, uh, the legal foundations of the copyright directive are basically the same as the legal foundations for the tobacco advertising directive from 1998, which was uh, effectively struck down on the basis of not actually uh, facilitating uh, free movement of goods or services, and, and basically was um, you know, was not you know within the scope of, of the competences of the European Union. Um, I don't know if there's been any challenges to that, but would there be a case for for trying to challenge the copyright directive on the basis of being basically outside the scope of the treaties? Um, well. Uh, I think you're referring to, to the subsidiarity challenges, so uh, basically national parliaments and also some other national uh, and uh, state bodies uh, can form a complaint to the European Union saying that this law is violating the treaties of the European Union and the European Union is trying to regulate something that it is not supposed to regulate. Because uh, the subsidiarity principle means that things should be um, organized on the lowest possible level and the European Union is only allowed to intervene if there's some sort of added benefit. Um, you could do that, but I, uh, that wouldn't actually solve any problems. Then you would still have uh, every single country kind of coming up with its own copyright exceptions because it's extremely rare that uh, a European country is trying to make a copyright exception that is not in some way covered by the list of exceptions that the European uh, uh, Directive, the Information Society Directive has. So I would say that the European, uh, the European Directive offers quite a lot of room for uh, the member states to make sensible copyright laws. The problem is rather that most of the member states decide not to. So uh, from my perspective, um, one of the big copyright problems right now is really that um, it's extremely difficult to exchange culture between countries because each of them has its own in implementation. So rather than trying to keep the European Union out of it, I would prefer to really try to use the European Union to set some minimum standards and to get some mandatory exceptions in there that are actually in the interest of the people. Any more question? Uh, I'm interested in your opinion on how the way copyright works in conjunction with other intellectual property laws, and if you have looked more into this. For example, in the furniture industry, I'm a bit more aware of the furniture industry in England, which currently has uh, five separate laws protecting. Furniture. And in UK, it's been pretty, for, it's pretty straightforward that it's 25 years protection of furniture. But for example, in Sweden, it's not really straightforward, and there's a big uh, clause of uncertainty for if the protection falls under copyright, or if it falls under the design protection, or if it falls, which law it falls under. So, my question is have you looked on? the differences between different intellectual property laws and how they work together with the copyright law? Um, I'm not an expert on uh, other intellectual property laws or uh, other in intellectual monopolies. I think what they all have in common is that they are trying to grant uh, a temporary monopoly uh, in exchange for uh, innovation or also for disclosing innovation. So if you look at something like the patent, system, the idea about, behind the patent system is supposed to be, okay, you get a, a protection of your invention for a limited amount of time, but in exchange you have to make the information of what you have actually invented public, and then afterwards everybody can use it. Um, one particular part of intellectual property law that I already know that I'm going to be working with is that the European Union is right now trying uh, to make uh, a directive for trade secrets. And trade secrets are a intellectual property that really doesn't make any sense to me at all because um, it's kind of 
like patent law, but taking away the good stuff, because uh, a trade secret is, by virtue of being a secret, something that you don't have to disclose to the world, and somehow people or companies now want to have an intellectual property right actually protecting this uh, secret, and the way I see it, secrets are rather an alternative to, um, to having something protected by law. Um, so this is something that I'm really going to have to uh, get into from now on. I've been working with copyright in the Pirate Party before uh, I was selected to the Parliament, but I haven't been working with, with patents and trade laws and so on uh, in the past, but uh, fortunately I hired somebody who's a lawyer in that field and hopefully she's going to uh, you know, put me up, up to speed. But I'm really also thankful for input from the Pirates parties on issues like that, like furniture uh, designs. I honestly have very little idea about that area. Uh, second question. Uh, the impact of 3D printers. And how it's going to affect the way people look on copyright? Um, 3D printers is uh, something that I'm going to have a lot of fun with my own uh, political group. As you perhaps know, I, uh, just like Amelia and Christian did in the last period, I once again joined the Green Group in the European Parliament. And the Greens are quite good when it comes to issues like uh, privacy, data protection, but uh, they are sometimes quite critical of new technological inventions and uh, particularly in terms of 3D printers there have been some voices from within that group saying that we need to strictly, strictly regulate this new technology because of consumer protection because usually like if you buy certain appliances in the store there are consumer protection laws that make sure that they have no sharp edges where you can hurt yourself and uh, also they have read some uh, worrying articles in the newspaper saying that somebody in Japan has printed a gun and uh, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, what you need to know about uh, 3D printing is that um, with these thousand euro 3D printers that you have at your local fab lab or hacker space, you cannot uh, build a functioning gun that uh, it does not uh, fall under already existing regulations. Like for example, if you have a gun, you first have to buy ammunition, and that ammunition is of course restricted, and without the parts that you cannot actually print out, you're not going to be able to do a lot of damage to yourself. So this is really something, uh, I think it's, it's kind of fear-mongering that is uh, pushed by uh, by industry, especially in the area of merchandising. Um, a lot of companies that used to make money uh, mostly off uh, it, well, uh, off of digital or, or immaterial works are now making money off of advertising. Uh, like, for example, uh, there was a case with uh, Game of Thrones. Um, Game of Thrones is a hugely successful uh, TV show and a lot of people are downloading it uh, through the internet, watching it for free and then are buying merchandise of all sorts. And then somebody uh, 3D printed a, uh, a hub for an iPhone charging station that looks like the throne uh, with all the swords from Game of Thrones. And now the uh, producer of Game of Thrones sued that person for making this, uh, making this uh, 3D printed merchandise. So I would think that the people who are trying to uh, uh, bring out all these issues about Ooh, 3D printers are really dangerous are coming from that direction that they fear that people are going to take um, building merchandise uh, into their own hands because this is something that can very easily be done with 3D printing. But, uh, well, in the long run, I think it's really going to challenge our ideas of um, well, of property, because 3D printers are basically uh, putting the modes of production into the hands of the people, to use some uh, socialist uh, phrases. And it's really going to change the way that we, uh, that we have to think about uh, property. But at the end of the day, uh, even 3D printers are still going to need raw materials. And like, it's not 
this very naive idea of saying, well, then I will be able to print out uh, s stuff from the internet, yeah, in a way, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you will not need materials anymore. So the, uh, I don't think it's going to to break down everything we know and uh, is going to lead us into some kind of purely immaterial promised land. But uh, I think it's a technology that can be very interesting for communities and it will give people a lot more opportunities to also repair things that they have built. Uh, because like um, a lot of uh, especially kind of electronic devices and so on are built in a way that they break down kind of fast and then you buy new ones. And of course if you have access to technology like 3D printing it gets much easier to, for example, have community centers where you can repair things very easily. And so uh, something that I have uh, done is I have asked the commission to actually uh, start a pilot project to give money to libraries to actually buy 3D printers and offer classes in how to use them. Because I think if we really want 3D printing to be a technology that is an emancipatory power that really gives power to the people, then we need to, first of all, give people access to this technology and we need to teach them how to use that because like, uh, not everybody knows how to build a 3D model of uh, a screwdriver. I don't know how to do that. And it would be great if libraries could actually uh, teach that sort of thing to people. for such an interesting presentation. I'm, I'm totally outsider, so neither academician nor pilot party. I'm a brother of uh, Arifoja, associate <laughs> professor Ar Fildre, which is a problem. Uh, I'm working for corporate bodies since 10 years in different jurisdictions. So the guy is hanging there. So, uh, but what I, I'm asking is, I came here to listen to the pirates and the, the idea and the, the global movement, etc. So what I would like to ask, I understand from your presentation uh, and what you are saying uh, to set up a minimum standard for the European countries uh, as for copyright, but what uh, the pirates, uh, the vision is, what, is there any universal uh, sort of a uh, vision for copyrights? Uh, Myself, it's a little story. When I worked in Canada, I was going to take a photocopy, which a Turkish person, it's okay for me to take a photocopy. I mean, I study in my university, taking photocopies, you know, read them and reference them. But at the library and the, in the corporate body, the, the, it was the corporate library. The lady, you can imagine the, the, the library lady, it's a standard, you know, it's very. <laughs> straight and she came to me and she said you can't take the photocopy you know it's a it's a universal problem i mean i understand the the, the physical uh, difficulties i mean you set up the minimum standards in europe but what the pirate is taking is there any uh, vision that uh, that you make it, uh, as a part of the global uh, movement you know that's sort of what we are thinking in terms of the copyright um. Thanks, uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, my ideal uh, vision for the future would be to find ways to solve the problems that copyright is trying to solve uh, without copyright. Because copyright was developed in a, in a world that didn't have the internet. And in a lot of senses, it is solving problems uh, in a way that nobody would have ever come up with if the internet had already existed. So I think what copyright is trying to achieve, first of all, is give an incentive for people to create. There are other ways of achieving that. We could discuss things like a universal basic income that would give people the, the ability to have uh, enough resources to be able to spend their time on whatever they want to, and I understand that it has to, that it is necessary for people to be able uh, to make a living, um, but I also believe that a lot of artists are still 
creating because they want to create, and we have to create, and we have to build a society where people can follow uh, this ambition to create something, and where the laws are uh, uh, are supporting them. But that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, through copyright. Um, essentially, I I would also. Uh, like to have a society where uh, sharing information and culture is the default and uh, that all exceptions from that are only made when there is an actual need to do so and uh, when somebody is actually profiting from that so kind of um, uh, changing, changing uh, this but uh, I mean I think the incentive to create is just one thing why we have copyright Another is, uh, at least in the continental European tradition of copyright, uh, there is also this idea of uh, droit d'auteur, of the, the right of the author, which is that um, an author should, have, uh, should be able to decide in which context their works can be used or not. So, for example, if McDonald's wants to use my artwork, uh, for the advertisement that I can say that no, I, I don't like McDonald's, I want to be able to forbid them to do that. I think we have to have uh, a societal discussion about whether or not we want to have this, uh, to be able to have this right, and I think there are good arguments for it, but um, if, we, uh, if we say that the, the main reason for copyright is to give artists control of their works, um, then it's not a commercial right, then it's really kind of a right of personality and we have to have a completely different approach. But uh, at the same time, I think everybody who is creating works is also building on the creations of others who have come before them and uh, we really have to think about whether such a, a right of personality makes sense um, because like it's very difficult to draw the line uh, how high a level uh, well of how much work and how much creativity has to go into a work for somebody to be able to claim that uh, they want to forbid others from using it because it's kind of somehow tied to their personality but uh, well, I think one thing that we can probably say is that uh, if we if we use copyright as kind of a personality right that gives people control, then it shouldn't be a right that lasts 70 years after their death. Uh, yeah, just some thoughts. But you know, it really depends on what copyright means to us as a society and what problem it's trying to solve. And I don't think we even have a consensus on that because people have completely different conceptions of why copyright is there in the first place. Hi, I want to ask about uh, the copyrights, about uh, the new media. You know that uh, the contents are produced by users in new media, but when you want to analyze data on Twitter, for example, you need to uh, uh, you need to buy the data you need from Twitter, and when you want to store these data on your server, servers, it's Ill illegal. But the contents are not the uh, produced by Twitter. Mm. The contents are produced by the Twitter users. Uh, do you think? Do you, do you have any? Uh, any actions about uh, this because uh, the on the me medium is uh, owned by the company but mm -hmm. we have to uh, pay, pay pay for the, uh, to take that uh, data to, to analyze these data uh, do you have any uh, anything or in a way to uh, make this free uh, for uh, the for researchers especially um. At the moment, uh, the European Union has a directive uh, for copyright on databases and uh, so on this basis um, companies can ask for money for access to their databases. I think this particular copyright is completely useless. Uh, I think there shouldn't be copyright on databases. 
because uh, yeah, as you as you are saying in the. Uh, uh, at the very most, the company owning the database has compiled uh, the works that are in the database, but that isn't a creative act, so I don't think it should fall under copyright. Um, but it's, of course, very difficult uh, uh, to, to achieve that. Um, I think what we can do as users is also to, um, to support more open alternatives to such services, like uh, for example, um, right now some people are building an alternative to Twitter called Elo because Twitter is becoming more and more commercial and it is really, uh, it's, it's putting advertisement into people's uh, Twitter streams and so on. Uh, but of course the problem is if, if you want to build an open alternative to a social network is that nobody wants to switch social networks because all their friends are already on Twitter. And it's the same with Facebook. So um, we have been discussing this problem in the European Union in the context of uh, data protection, because uh, a lot of people are upset about uh, the Facebook uh, data protection uh, because uh, well, Facebook is is violating people's privacy and so on. So uh, what the proposal in this area is uh, to have a right to data portability. That means that at least every individual should have a right to get all their tweets from Twitter and uh, or to get all their personal information from a social network. But uh, this isn't, of course, it isn't really an immediate solution for researchers. But at least it makes it easier for people to move from one system to a different one, and that's really something that we should encourage. I'm sorry, I can't take less uh, question. Yeah, thanks a lot also for tackling this massive assignment because uh, it is such a huge um, task to try to figure out how we're going to tackle the copyright issue. Uh, I've been looking a little bit at both, uh, have, and I just want to ask if you have uh, looked at the uh, Finnish Citizens Initiative? No, but not yet. Okay. But I'd be happy to read it. It's good that there's a translation. Uh, because they have some uh, suggestions on, you know, particular laws, and I think that uh, in most parts of Europe we're dealing with very similar copyright laws. It's, goes back to uh, before there were cars or something uh, uh, for the Bern Convention. Uh, so I've also been looking a little bit at the, and I strongly encourage uh, pirates and, and including your team that's working on the copyright issues to look at what the um, uh, the internet party is doing in uh, Switzerland, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and I just want to ask if you have, because a big part of the copyright stuff is also access uh, to stuff that should be in the public domain when it comes to academia and research and so forth. Uh, so I want to ask if you looked at the Aaron Swartz uh, law uh, in that regard, and if you have at all looked at uh, some of the Marco, it's called the Marco law or something from Brazil. So I'm just wondering, shouldn't we, like the pirates that are trying to sort of create some, actually, I'm worried what legal patching is, it's just so depressing. Uh, like, have there been any discussion about sort of just creating a comprehensive, sort of uh, all-embracing proposal or something like that? Or, uh, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about sort of your vision on how you're going to tackle it legally because lobbying is not going to get us anywhere. Uh, fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, actually one of my uh, new assistants uh, came to me and said, well, uh, what do you think how much time it would take us to write a European copyright from scratch? And uh, I think that would be a worthwhile endeavor. And uh, what you have said earlier about the uh, the way that the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative was written, uh, I find that very encouraging. And uh, there is some kind of basis for that. Uh, there is uh, copyrightcode.eu, which is um, kind of a, a framework or very basic 
uh, European copyright that was written by a couple of researchers of the, the Witten project. And this would be something that we could use as a basis for, for like a legal text. Um, the problem is, which, what is different from, from uh, the way that the Icelandic parliament is working is that as a parliamentarian, I could not actually introduce this bill to parliament because the European parliament doesn't have a right of initiative. So this is one really important tool that I am missing as a parliamentarian. I would still be dependent on the European Commission making a proposal first. However, um, the European Parliament can ask the Commission to become active in a certain manner. Um, and I think it would still be very worthwhile for the public debate to have a concrete proposal that we could then also use for amendments when this thing is being uh, discussed in Parliament. So, yeah, I, I know some people from the Marco Civil. Uh, I haven't been in touch with the, um, with the uh, New Zealand Internet Party also because German uh, Internet activists tend to have some very old beef with, uh, with Kim.com, so it's a bit, a bit uh, difficult. But uh, yeah, I think maybe we can um, get kind of the best practices from, from the Finnish case, from the Mexican case, and try uh, to to uh, channel that into an actual proposal for a European copyright. I think it would definitely be worthwhile to bring the discussion forward, even if we can't actually put it into Parliament the way that we uh, imagined it. Okay. It's in my calendar, but I think there's something else at the same time. Yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, when? Uh, I will check. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to have to wrap up. But uh, thanks a lot for all the questions. And well, I'll be around for a while, so we can discuss it some more. Thank you.